I always like to come up with first, you know, come up with something that's unique and different and that will uh, inspire people to follow suit and, and to try something along those lines. Hello, Cal Poly Pomona students, faculty, staff, and beyond. My name is Henry Lee. I am a music industry studies student and the host of Cal Poly Pomona Music Couches, where we bring in guests to have a talk as if we were sitting on the couches in the music department building on campus. Today's guest, we have Nadia Spachenko. Dr. Nadia Spachenko is a Ukrainian piano performer and instructor leading the piano performance program at CPP. She is also a Steinway artist, a Grammy award-winning artist, and a toy pianist. The following interview was recorded live on November 30th, 2020. Um, Dr. Spachenko, would you like to introduce yourself to the audience? Um, hello, I am very excited to talk to everyone, yeah, even though it's uh, virtually. Um, and I'm excited to meet all of you once we get back to in-person instruction. Um, so I'm Dr. Nadia Shpachenko. I was born in Ukraine. I'm Ukrainian-American pianist and uh, teacher. And I have been teaching at Cal Poly for, I think it's 16 years now, um, long time, <laughs> um, 15 years maybe. And um, I uh, head the, the piano area at Cal Poly Pomona. So I teach everything piano related. I teach all the studio uh, piano classes, not all of them. Um, uh, we have other faculty who teach uh, some, some studio classes as well, but um, I teach studio and I teach piano seminar and piano ensemble and collaborative piano class. So the two chamber music classes with piano and class piano, piano literature. So anything piano related, that's my area. And um, I perform uh, quite extensively. Now, of course, with COVID, I perform virtually mostly. I mean, only, <laughs> I would say. And I'm a recording artist. I am a very active recording artist. I have released um, three solo CDs. And my first solo CD um, was nominated for three Grammy Awards. And my third solo CD actually won a Grammy Award for Best Classical Compendium, which is sort of like CD of the year. Um, in, in the classical genre where where the CD has a theme. So this is a, a thematic um, CD that I'll talk about more later, I'm sure. And um, generally my specialty is commissioning composers and um, premiering works and then touring new works. So I like to bring repertoire uh, to this world and then make it popular so that as a pianist played and that's kind of my big passion and mission uh, in music um, to bring as many pieces as possible uh, into this world and to collaborate with talented composers. Um, so I have so far collaborated with very many composers. I have premiered more than 70 works, um, I think since my time at Cal Poly uh, started. And um, Yes, well, once I tour the pieces, once I commission them, I record them and I try to keep my CDs um, thematically interesting so that um, each one has some kind of a story, some kind of an inspiration that ties all the pieces together. So that's that's kind of an overview of what I do, but I'm sure you have more questions so I can go into more detail <laughs> as you ask me the questions. This is all great. I notice how you like collaborate with like a lot of artists, composers and musicians. I noticed that piano performers are often solo performers. I feel like you make the effort to like form with like other performers and work for composers as well. I feel like that would be like a great thing to like note that like not all musicians have to like be solo. First question that I usually ask every guest is how has the pandemic been for you? How have you been like holding it up? Um, what things have changed for you? Did anything stop for you? Or did you start any new hobbies? <laughs> hobbies? <laughs> I don't think I have time for hobbies. Uh, I think both I and, and all my colleagues are working many, many more hours now that, that everything is online. It, it takes a lot of time and dedication to make it work successfully for the students. So I have been just so extreme, extremely busy uh, this semester, um, just really focusing on teaching my students and uh, finding creative projects that will keep them engaged and keep them learning, uh, even though I can't see them in person. I feel like um, 
I have a system that works very nice. Uh, I have a setup that's very nice where students can hear me well and they can see me. So especially for one-on-one -on -one instruction, I feel like it works pretty well. Uh, of course, nothing is as good as um, being in person when you're teaching music, but th this is this is actually working pretty well, I would say. And my students are uh, making great progress. So that makes me extremely happy. That's kind of my... Uh, my big passion really to, you know, to see my students um, succeed, to see them improve. And that's what makes me very happy. So I've been focusing really on that. And of course, since I can't perform live because of COVID, um, I haven't been performing live, but I have given some live performances. I actually gave a live performance um, in Ukraine in support of uh, breast cancer research and patients uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and actually yesterday I did a live interview also in Ukraine and I, um, I performed a couple of live um, concerts and I have taught some master classes at other universities. So I did a master class for Occidental College, for Orange County High School for the Arts at uh, Cal State Northridge. Um, so, so I'm, I'm still doing the things that I was doing when, when I was traveling, except now I'm doing them from home and I'm still recording. I actually was able to record, um, three tracks for a CD by South African flutist, Walter Kellerman. He, he's a Grammy, um, winning flutist and he's very well known, especially in South Africa. He's like the top flutist there and um he's not a classical flutist although he's classically trained uh but he's more of a world roots um flutist but then for this cd he wanted pieces that were more classically inspired and um both he and his uh his colleague who is a jazz pianist wrote three pieces for me and him to perform and record and i recorded my part here at home uh luckily i have a wonderful piano and i was able to to make a good quality recording and then he recorded his flute part um um, in his studio and then we put everything together we even managed to make music videos long distance like this and it actually came out as a very cool project and I'm very happy with it and we did that in August um, so right before school started and actually I was finishing up this project the first few weeks since school started and um, it was very rewarding and it's a very different kind of collaboration but we made it work and I'm glad that we were able to to do this and even to do these videos which was really hard I had to film my videos um, when we had fires here. So it was impossible to breathe outside. And <laughs> I had to find a location where I could bring the piano outside so that I, I guess I didn't want to be indoors near anybody. I, I didn't want to uh, make anybody sick and I didn't want to get sick. So I wanted to be as safe as possible uh, and be able to socially distance. So I was able to, after many weeks of searching, I was able to record this um, at Dr. Yates's uh, backyard he was able to wheel his Steinway out and it, it came out really uh, beautifully and so so I'm still doing all the things I was doing before but I'm doing them virtually now and um, I don't have any time for hobbies at this point <laughs> I'm just working 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 but it's it's exciting I'm excited to be able to continue doing what I do despite the pandemic wow you seek like all of these like alternatives and ways to like still continue doing what you do um, very different. And since we're like at this troubling time, it, everything's like experimental as well with how we try to like find ways to do, continue doing what we usually have done. I was able to um, come to the faculty recital. Um, you have like two songs that you performed. Yes, two pieces. Yes. And one of them was uh, was with the flutist that I was just talking about. And one of them was actually um, a piece by our newest, um, one of our two newest uh, full time faculty uh, members, um, Evan Weir. So that was a very virtuosic and difficult piece to learn. I was excited to learn a piece by a new colleague. So uh, and also record it here and share it with the Kalpoli community. So that, that was exciting to do. And I actually played that piece in my Ukrainian um concert as well so that was a ukrainian premiere of it <laughs> so that was exciting wow collaborating with others you have been like following um social distancing guidelines and oh all yes that. for sure i'm i take this very seriously yes yeah. so how did you become a piano performer and like how did you know that this is like a career for you I actually always wanted to be a pianist. Uh, my mom um, is a pianist and a piano teacher, and she was my first teacher. And uh, as as I was growing up, I 
listen to her teach for hours and hours. Um, she would actually bring her students home since there were no babysitters uh, that we had access to in Ukraine. And um, so I was able to be while she was working to be there and listen to her teach. And I think I got very inspired and I wanted to be playing piano by my, myself as well. So I, I've always known that I wanted to be a pianist. I also studied cello and flute and a little bit of guitar and uh, composition and jazz improvisation. But at some point, I just focused just on piano performance uh, to advance my career as a performer and um, just put everything into it. I would practice eight hours a day and enter competitions and perform as many concerts as possible and um, just did what, what it took to, to build a career. And I was very lucky and that I was able to build a career that was successful and, and, and also get this job at Cal Poly, which I absolutely love. So I've been very happy here and I've been here a long time. I noticed that in like your video performances that you also um, perform like on toy piano as well. What like made you like incorporate like toy piano into your chamber performances? I really like the sound of the toy piano and I also like um, playing pieces that are unusual, that have unusual timbres, unusual instrument combinations. And uh, toy piano actually is a pretty popular instrument among new music performers and composers right now. And uh, it was sort of this, this trend was started by John Cage. He wrote a piece for toy piano and um, he's actually a toy, toy piano artist, a Sean Hart artist. And I'm also a Sean Hart artist. Sean Hart is sort of like the Steinway of toy pianos. It's a company that makes very good quality toy pianos. So it's kind of funny because he was the first one. And right now there are quite a lot of performers who are serious classical um, contemporary performers and they incorporate toy piano into their performances. And I, I like to commission composers to write pieces that incorporate different instruments. So toy piano is one of them. And for example, when I was working on my first CD, which was a sabbatical project, my first sabbatical here at Cal Poly, I wanted to have a piece for toy piano, piano and electronics. And at that time, that was the only piece of this kind in the world. There was no other piece for this instrument combination. And it um, turned out such a successful piece. It, it was written by Tom Flaherty. I collaborated with Tom Flaherty from Pomona College and also Genevieve Fei Wen Lee, who is a professor at Pomona College. She played the toy piano and I played the piano. And uh, the piece just turned out so so well that uh, right now it's played by many ensembles in around the world and it actually got a grammy nomination that track got a grammy nomination just on it of its own uh, just for that track that's how popular it became so it was very exciting because now there are actually other pieces for piano toy piano and electronics but this was the first i always like to come up with firsts you know come up with something that's unique and different and that will uh, inspire people to follow suit and, and to try something along those lines. So that was a really great project. And then for my second CD, I wanted to double everything and I commissioned the piece with two pianos, two toy pianos and electronics. Uh, and that might have been a first as well at that time. So that was also an amazing piece by the same composer. And I commissioned other composers to write pieces for toy piano and voice for me and toy piano and piano and voice, those different combinations. Peter Yates actually wrote a piece for me for toy piano and toy percussion. Um, and uh, Dr. Coplin also wrote a piece for me, I think also for toy piano and toy percussion. So um, it's been an interesting exploration. And I also like exploring other instruments to combine with piano, like percussion, like actually playing percussion at the same time as playing the piano. I had some pieces by composer Adam Schoenberg where I had to play percussion with my feet while playing the piano with my hands. And then some pieces where I also played percussion with my hands and feet and and also had other performers uh, there were chamber pieces like that as well some of them i actually uh worked on with my students there was a piece uh, for 10 pianists that i performed and toured with my students with my piano ensemble where we had all kinds of toy percussion um toy piano um, two pianos and very interesting combination of instruments so it's just a passion of mine to combine sonorities to combine different instruments and find something novel um, in classical music. I feel like this is what like new music is all about. Um, just like trying out new instruments, adding new instruments, being experimental with it. And with like, as like a part of chamber music as well, uh, how did you like become like a recording musician, recording artist? This is like what like, um, music performers like usually end up doing. Um, some of them 
it just depends. Uh, but I, I think most um, recording, most performing artists are also recording artists because they want to record the, the pieces that they're working on and that they're touring so that they can stay uh, for, for people to listen to even once the performer is done performing that program. So I think it's probably pretty common and I think it's very important to record, especially what I do when, when I commission composers, um, my recordings are first recordings, the world premiere recordings. So all three of my solo CDs are um, world premiere recordings. So when other people want to learn those pieces, um, they will have a chance to listen um, to, to, to an example to the first recording where I collaborated with the composer. So these are sort of the definitive recordings of the pieces because it's a very close collaboration um, to make sure that I use my imagination, but I also do everything that the composer wanted um, to convey in the pieces. So uh, for me, that's extremely important uh, when I commission these pieces to, to record the works so that other people have access to them, they can hear them, they can then get interested and uh, ask for the music or purchase the music um, from the composer or even commission those composers to write pieces for them. So this is how we um, promote new music is by recordings and, and also performances, of course. I tend to um, tour the pieces I commission quite a lot. My first program from my first uh, CD, Woman at the New Piano, I performed um, more than 50 times, actually. So um, that's a lot for new music, especially. <laughs> yeah, that's like a lot for performing Definitely. to do. I, I, I usually perform a lot of concerts. And I also, you know, besides those three CDs that I'm talking about, the solo CDs, I also record a lot of chamber music or solo pieces for other composers. For example, I was on Isaac Schenkler's wonderful uh, album, Because Patterns. I recorded a piece that they wrote for me um, called Future Feelings, a wonderful solo uh, piano and electronics piece. And then I also recorded a piece recently for composer Vera Ivanova that's coming out of her, on her um, upcoming CD on Naxos. And um, I've recorded some chamber works uh, as well. Uh, one of them that came out last year um, for composer Gernot Wolfgang. We recorded a trio that, that he wrote. Um, it was also a world premiere recording. All of these were world premieres. So, so in addition to my solo CDs, I also collaborate a lot with other artists and it's it's so fun to collaborate and it's so rewarding to work with other artists as well so so i like to to have a combination of solo performances and collaborative performances and then the same in recordings as well wow that's great next question how did you become like an educator at cal poly oh no well i always wanted to be a professor i always wanted to teach um in a university at a university level um, that was always my goal. That's just something that I really love working with uh, students, undergraduate students, especially because uh, they still have a lot of time to build their skill at that, at that um, level and at that age. So um, I, after I finished my doctorate at USC, I worked um, at Pomona College, but it was a temporary position, a sabbatical replacement position. And then I applied uh, to a lot of places. And that year, um, I actually had a lot of offers and I chose Cal Poly for many different reasons. Um, and um, yeah, I started at Cal Poly in 2006. So I was lucky because uh, that was the first uh, full-time uh, position that, that I got. And I liked, uh, liked it so much at Cal Poly that I never wanted to leave. So I, I stayed this whole time. But I also teach part-time at um, Claremont Graduate University. I have um, a few um, doctoral students there every once in a while. And um, actually every semester I have one or two. But um, just so that sometimes uh, some of my students, for example, might want to continue with me and study um, for their doctorate and their master's uh, with me. So Michael John, for example, is one of those students who studied with me at Cal Poly and then is finishing up his doctorate now at, at Claremont Graduate University. So that's kind of a, a place where I, I, I just focus on graduate students, but uh, but only, you know, one or two students uh, per semester. So my main place is really called Poly. And then I also tour and uh, present master classes. So I teach students at other universities as a guest. That's something I do a lot as well. Nice. You are the director of the piano ensemble at Cal Poly Pomona. What is like your favorite thing about like directing the your own ensemble on campus? Oh, I love directing uh, the piano ensemble. It's so much fun because I get to choose really interesting repertoire. It's such an unusual 
type of ensemble uh, because I tend to find pieces that are not just for two pianists, but are for five pianists or six pianists, six pianists or 10 pianists. And um, I, I get to either commission or find really interesting repertoire and sometimes to even collaborate with other ensembles and other performers. So it's just really great working together with um, as a group. Uh, chamber music is one of my greatest passions as a performer. So I like to 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 sort of transfer to the, the, this passion uh, for chamber music uh, to my students to kind of inspire them to learn about this genre and this um, way of collaborating. And it's really fun because at Calpoli, we're so fortunate. It's very unique because we get to tour um, sometimes and we get to play for many guest artists. So students at Calpoli Pomona, my piano ensemble students get to perform for world-class artists um, in master classes and then also to tour and to perform, to basically do what I do, to kind of um, try it out. Uh, I actually took them um, a couple of years ago, I took them on tour to uh, New York. They played at Juilliard and Manas College of Music, those are top schools in the world. And they also played in many uh, universities and colleges in California and also in master classes. So I, I love doing this, basically modeling what I do as a professional pianist um, with my ensemble and actually touring with these students and, and, and playing with them. That's another part that I really like playing with the students. So yes, um, directing the piano ensemble is one of the most rewarding things that I do at Cal Poly. I, I always look forward to it every semester. Great. If you're like interested in piano and like to like work with other piano students on campus and the piano ensemble would be a great ensemble to be a part of. Is there like anywhere online where we can watch these performances? Yes, actually, the piano ensemble um, has made many really professionally done uh, performances, uh, recordings, uh, video recordings. So um, I have them both on my um, YouTube page and the Calpoli page. They actually they live on the Calpoli page, and there's actually a playlist Calpoli Pomona Piano Ensemble on the Calpoli Pomona. Uh, music department YouTube page. And then I also uh, embedded them so people can find them if they go to my page. But they're hosted uh, on the Calpoli YouTube page. And there are a lot of recordings there, uh, video recordings um, of my students and me playing together. And um, uh, anybody who wants to check out the piano ensemble should definitely listen to those. They're very interesting pieces that we perform. And the performances are recorded very well by media vision with multiple cameras. It's a really good quality um, presentation of these works. And so people can get a really good idea of what the piano ensemble does. Nice. So um, what should a piano student know about you before like becoming? Before I become their teacher? Yes. Um, I really love what I do. I really love teaching. I really love seeing my students progress. I love seeing them inspired and eager to learn new new repertoire to discover new things about piano about music um and cal poly pomona is a place uh, that's very unique in 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 the way that it the community works here so the students and the faculty at cal poly pomona music department are so supportive um and um everybody knows Every, every faculty member knows every student really well, and they're very involved in helping them succeed and advising them through the program. And the students are also, uh, many students become friends for life. Uh, from what I see, many of our alumni um, stay in touch. Uh, some of them even get married, you know, form families. I, The community is just very um, tight and, and friendly and supportive and I feel like the, the friendships um, that the students form here are basically going to be with them their whole life and the education they get they get here is so so solid and so uh, the the things that they pursue here are so inspiring and so eye-opening that they really then uh, have more options um, available to them whether it's graduate school or work and uh, they can really explore things uh, that they're going to do um, as professionals here at Cal Poly Pomona collaborating with as students uh, with similar interests. There are so many different things that students do here at Cal Poly Pomona. You know, they could be training to be classical performers or jazz performers, or they could be 
learning to be producers or um, recording artists. There are just so many things uh, that students can learn here. And um, the, the genres that they study and the, they cover in their cu curriculums um, are so diverse as well. I feel like we are only one of few institutions that embrace classical music and popular music and as a genre um, as well, jazz, world music, really um, in, anything that's, we're not like, like a typical conservatory that only focuses on classical and jazz. We are much more diverse in, um, in what we cover and um, in what the students are interested in. We, we let them pursue um, things that they're interested in that, that are, have a wide variety um that they that they can learn and and um get interested in and explore and get experience in so i feel like kapolikamona is a great place for that and we also have many uh students here who are first generation college students who some of them even don't have the typical experience as players uh, that uh, students do when they enter as a conservatories which where usually you have to be studying pretty much since you're five or six um, to be able to be a performer. And many of them actually end up being successful performers, which is pretty unique, I, I think, to this, to, to this university. I think it's the community, the, the support, um, the collegiality that, uh, that uh, the students and the faculty and the staff here uh, all embrace and, and cherish that, that makes this place so unique. And I am very, very happy to be part of it. Yeah. Um, what we're doing right now with the podcast um, is trying to like promote like you know Cal Poly music community and how like COVID has like kind of like struck forcing everyone to be in like an online environment and point of this podcast is like to get like part of the community together and like to um, very much inform people about like who are these people who are these professors faculty um, um, just like spreading awareness and as a way to like promote the Cal Poly Pomona Music Department as well. Do you have like any advice for like any person aspiring to become a pianist or a musician? Yes, definitely. Um, do what you love and don't get discouraged. Uh, don't think about um, money, business, anything like this. Just do what you love and you will find ways to make it work as, as a profession. Uh, I feel like those who get to be musicians and make a living being musicians are very, very fortunate because we tend to do something that's very rewarding, that's really fun, and uh, we get to do something we love and then make a living doing it. And I think it's difficult to make it in the music business for sure, but I think students need to to realize if this is their passion, if this is what they want to do, they just need to give it their all and not be afraid to reach out to professors, ask them for career advice, um, to be active, to to really do as many things as they can, to explore as many opportunities as they can, whether it's uh, any performance opportunity that they have uh, on campus, off campus, uh, any clubs, involvement in clubs, outreach, um, networking, basically to just explore many different aspects of the music industry and Cal Poly is a great place to do that. We have so many things uh, already set in place for students to explore and to network and, and to get better, you know, to perform and to get performance experience, to get uh, music business experience, music industry experience. So I would just say, follow your passion. And if music is your passion, just give it your all, you know, just, just uh, do something to improve um what you already know to improve your skill constantly every day make a goal to to learn something new to kind of uh set a set a high bar and constantly try and, and and do your best but at the same time also make sure that you balance uh your life well so that you're not overwhelmed you know if you're working while studying make sure that you set realistic goals um and uh, many students at cal poly are also working some of them are in full time and they make it work so just uh, just make sure you know uh, what you can do, what you can handle in terms of the available time to you, and then just give it your all, you know, just work hard, uh, get inspired, reach out to professors, reach out to other musicians, learn from other musicians, whether they're your peers at Cal Poly or professional musicians, and just uh, try kind of everything to know what, what it is that makes you happy. Give it your all. That's what you hear from Dr. Spachenko. Thank you for the advice about your last CD. First question I have about Poetry Places is about the 
concepts of it. The concept of the poetry places surrounds various locations and architecture. Uh, would you like to explain more about this concept and the selection of locations? Um, yes. So as I mentioned, when, when I come up with recording projects, um, I like to have a theme, something that inspires all the composers and inspires me and also something that ties the pieces together so so that I can present a variety of styles uh, and different takes um, on, 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 on a concept that that would be interesting and engaging for the audiences. So I um, collaborated with six wonderful composers well, well six composers for solo pieces and then two composers for ensemble pieces so eight total composers um to come up with come up with places that inspired the composers that were different in their architecture and their style and their function that could make this program work and make this program be very interesting to not just musicians but also to visual artists to people interested in architecture and outdoors and, and um buildings so each piece on this program is inspired by a specific building so i was asked to perform a concert at disney hall which is one of the most gorgeous uh, acoustically superb buildings in the world designed by frank gary an architect who actually lives in los angeles one of the top architects in the world and uh, I thought that that was such a great opportunity to get started with this program. And um, I was able to commission a few composers to write for that recital. And that was the start of this program. I think this was in 2015. So I was asked to perform a concert for Piano Sphere series uh, at Disney Hall, at Red Cat at Disney Hall. And uh, so I commissioned a few composers to write pieces for that program. One of these composers, always wanted to write about another Frank Gehry building, which is in New York. It's the IAC building. And it also looks sort of a ship, like a ship in full sail. And Disney Hall looks like that a little bit as well, like, like, a, like a tall ship. And it's so, so interesting. The, the New York building is made of glass. And of course, Disney Hall is made of titanium, I think. And it's just, uh, but the buildings have a, quite a connection between them. So one of the composers um, who, who was, um, the first composer, actually, who I asked to write for this project was Harold Meltzer. And then I also asked uh, a composer, Louis, Louis Spratlin, a Pulitzer winning composer from the from the Boston area, from Massachusetts, to write a piece. And he chose a building that he always wanted to write about, which is in Bangladesh by architect uh, Louis Kahn. He actually, Louis Spratlin studied um, Louis, Louis Kahn's work, and he actually wrote an opera on on his work. And so he was very interested already in architecture and wanted to put in, into music that also very, very fascinating building, which is also uh, connected to water. A lot of uh, buildings and, and pieces uh, on this program are connected to water somehow. Either they have water around them or um, they look like they could go in the water, like the like the IC building. It looks like a ship that could just go in the water. And it's um, um, near the harbor as well. So that was the start of this program. And then I reached out to other composers and asked them what inspires them, what buildings inspire them. And some composers would choose, choose buildings that inspired them in terms of their architecture. Some composers chose buildings that inspired them in terms of their history, like, for example, the Copland House, a house where Aaron Copland lived and created. Or uh, some composers would choose uh, a building that inspired them in through what's inside, like the American visionary art museum in Baltimore that was Amy Beth Kirsten's piece uh, and it was about uh, what was inside the museum it's um, it was a specific exhibit called hope um, and um, it presented art brute which is art by often untrained artists sort of kind of a pure um, pure talent to just just um, art that that these artists produce without any formal training as artists and these artists very often survived tremendous traumas and then came out ahead and found hope um, in the end. So there's so much history and so much uh, interesting information about each piece and each piece has a very different angle to it. So so the ways that the building inspired the composer is very different and um, the instrumentation is different. There are six solo pieces, mostly for piano, but some are for piano and electronics. One piece is for piano, toy piano, and voice, where I sing and play both instruments at the same time. And then there are two ensemble pieces, one for two pianos and two percussionists playing 
handmade percussion that's made out of materials that Frank Gehry's house is made of. And that piece is called Frank's House by Andrew Norman. And um, so there are actually two Frank Gehry uh, inspired pieces on this program. And then there is a, a piece for two pianos and electronics by Nina C. Young. And that piece is inspired by the Danilo bell bells that hang at uh, Harvard University. Uh, so, so it's kind of a part of a building. Those are historic bells that were brought um, uh, here uh, from Russia. Actually, they were saved. The original ones were saved uh, from Stalin um, uh, and preserved. And then they went back to Moscow. But now the exact replicas are still there in Harvard. So it's just very interesting. Uh, my CD has very interesting program notes about each piece. And I have done a lot of interviews. And I've recorded some music videos, uh, some of them actually features the buildings and show different parts of the buildings uh, some of them even the parts that inspired each section like the in full sale video by Harold Meltzer I actually have a whole video where you can see the building and the different parts um, that inspired the piece also the Copland house video you can actually see have a very rare sneak peek at the um, Copland house inside and outside so it's very it's a very interesting project it was very rewarding to work on this project and it clearly resonated with other people as well since it, it won a Grammy award and um, the pieces became quite popular you know other people already playing um, playing some of them and that's always my goal wow uh, it looks like um this project requires like a lot of studying with like the environment and like location the architecture exactly have you happened to um visit any of these locations yes i visited all the buildings uh in the u.s i just uh didn't visit the two buildings that are uh abroad so one of the buildings um that are not uh in the u.s is in bangladesh um and then one of them is in ireland shian brew and that's the oldest extant building it's five thousand years old it's a wonderful building but i studied it very closely i collaborated with a uh, researcher and uh, a person who takes, who basically studies um, th these uh, Irish monoliths and writes books about them and takes beautiful uh, photos and videos. And he actually provided me some of them uh, to use in my booklet and in my music videos. So um, I have studied very, very in depth uh, those buildings, even though I didn't actually visit them. And all the ones in the United States I visited, Frank Gehry was even very nice to to let me visit and uh, I actually did a, uh, a photo shoot outside his uh, his house for the CD. So it's, it's a very, and he actually let um, Andrew Norman uh, go inside and compose and get inspired um, to compose the piece inside. And he gave him a, a great tour of the place. And that's like one of the most unique uh, residences you'll ever see. You know, like in the living room, you have a ceiling that's made of glass and you can see the office above it. <laughs> you can see the table and um, it's just such a unique building with such a unique function and shape. And uh, it's very, very inspiring. So, yes, I, I definitely uh, delved into architecture and the study of architecture and really enjoyed going to these locations and getting inspired. Like, uh, for example, I premiered the piece um, that was inspired by the American Visionary Art Museum and the Hope exhibit. I premiered it in Baltimore, just uh, a few minutes away from the museum at Peabody Conservatory. So I went to the museum and I spent some time there, got inspired. That, that exhibit that inspired the piece was actually still there at that time. So I was able to see the, the actual exhibit and, and then premiere the piece very close um, to it. And then I was able to visit the Copland house as well. And I even made a video there for my music video and um, all the other buildings as well. So this was really fun to do. Um, you got to um, perform these pieces live before, right? Oh, yes. I, I toured them before. I, I always tour pieces to make sure I know them really well before I record them. OK. I was just um, curious about that. What would be like your memorable part of this creation process whether it's in like recording or or like working with the composers it was all it was all so fun and so so inspiring uh, but I, th I think the peak of it was actually recording the cd and i recorded it as another stunning place you know it's not just uh buildings it's places it's it's what's around the building that's also very inspiring so when i recorded this uh, the CD, I recorded it at Skywalker Sound. And that's like one of the most inspiring music studios in the world. And uh, it's basically a town on its own. It's very private. It's very secluded. You can only go there if you're working on a project there. And it's basically 
acres and acres of land with animals and and you know for breakfast you get the eggs from the chickens that are there you you can i mean it means it's amazing it's it's an amazing place with so much history of course you can see like star wars artifacts and uh george lucas's library and um we actually swam at lake in lake ewok right next to the recording studio uh, it was just an amazing experience so there was a culmination of this project to to, to t take it there and record it in such a stunning place and acoustically um, stunning as well. And I was able to record it on two wonderful Steinway pianos that were brought in there, especially for me for this recording. So it was just it was just a, a highlight, uh, I, I would say, of this project, just being able to record it in such an incredible place and um, you know, sort of immortalize the sound of it, of those pieces. So it, the, the whole the whole project was so wonderful. And then also working with visual artists um, and making this very beautiful booklet that that had so many images and such such detailed program notes. So it really is there is a really in, extensive visual component to the CD that's uh, really interesting for people to check out. So not just the music, but really to learn about these pieces, to learn about this architecture um, that inspired each piece, those places, to learn about the composers, to actually see them, to see the pictures, to see uh, the pictures of the places, to see the pictures. Um, uh, of some of our collaboration. I have a picture from from Skywalker, uh, also from the recording sessions. And it's just it's just a visually and uh, visually interesting project in addition to being very interesting uh, from the musical standpoint. And I love combining arts, you know, it's one of my passions <laughs> to combine different art forms. This all sounds very exciting for you. I've only been um, listening to this CD um, just like, just to like the music, but not, not with like a visual accompaniment as well, like the buildings. Is this like information like available, like on the internet? Yes, for sure. So, um, first of all, my YouTube channel, I have a couple of music videos that feature images of the buildings and, um, videos of me playing the pieces. So that's really helpful because then you can really see there's a trailer that, that I made for this uh, CD that actually has a little bit of each piece and it includes images of all the buildings. Uh, and then, uh, there is also a full music video of the full in full sale piece. Uh, that's about the IAC building in Manhattan written by Harold Meltzer. And there's also a, an excerpt um, of the Give Me Your Songs piece by Hannah Lash, who is a Yale professor. And that one includes footage of the Aaron Copland house, very rare footage.
Let's see. And there are there are pieces. I think there are at least um, excerpts of pieces that include uh, video and images. Um, I think for each uh, for each of these works. And then also the booklet is downloadable for free. You can download it from the um, the the record labels website and also from my website. So referencerecordings.com has a site for this CD and there's a, a booklet that you can download there. Or if you go if you go to nadiashpachenko.com, I have a page that's actually very um, beautifully laid out specifically for this CD that has pictures of each building, information about where each piece was premiered. Um, you can download the booklet. You can download a lot of different images. So there's a great visual component there and you can also read reviews and you can listen. Uh, there are links to listen on many different platforms. So it, it's available on all platforms, basically Apple Music, Spotify, um, all of them basically. And there are links there so people can choose the platform that they prefer. And then there are links also to the videos as well. So it's all in one place. So if some somebody was actually very interested in learning more about the CD, they should just go to my page. I think that's the most ex extensive uh, page in terms of having all the information in one place. So nadiashpachenko.com and then you just click on recordings, click on the poetry of places and it has everything uh, right there. So you can just click on diff different links and watch the videos, read the booklet, see pictures. Um, so it's a, it's a great place to start. Thank you for that. This is all great for the audience who is currently listening to this podcast. With you um, winning a Grammy in November 2019, the Poetry of Places was nominated for Best Classical Compendium for the 62nd Annual Grammy Awards. And then in January following year, you received the award for Best Classical Compendium for the Poetry of Places. Um, first of all, I want to say um, congratulations. I know I'm like a couple months late. Um, how was it like being nominated and awarded? A Grammy Award. Oh, it was just wonderful. It was such a good time, um, especially going through the Grammy ceremony and uh, going on the red carpet and giving interviews and then meeting all these great artists there and then partying with them while Gloria Gaynor was singing. And it was just, just wonderful. You know, it just the whole experience was just absolutely um, something that I will never forget in my life. And um, I was so fortunate because COVID hit like very soon after. In fact, it was already in China, uh, in Wuhan um, at that time. And then very soon after the Grammys, um, we, everything closed down here as well. And um, so I was so lucky that I was able to experience the Grammys in person. For example, this year, the Grammys are all virtual, but it's just such a great experience being there and meeting these different people or even catching up with artists whose music you admire, but who you never met in person, uh, who are also nominated. Um, it's just it's just such a rewarding socially and musically and it's just such an ex exhilarating experience being able to do it and also to have designers make you dresses and, and you know and, and to go to all these grammy parties and not just the, the day itself but i it, it's just the whole grammy weekend it's it's an experience that's unforgettable so i was so so fortunate to to have that experience and then of, on top of it all to actually win the grammy and to give my acceptance speech and talk about what you know what makes new music so special to my heart and how much i like to advance new music and composers and 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 promote uh, that genre and those works and i was very actually very happy because new music uh you know it's it's a small kind of niche um genre you know from overall classical genre but but it's actually very well represented in the grammys and i i think that that's really great because they realize that that's the most important part of classical music that's the part where we create something new in classical music and hopefully create something that will be there in the next century and in a few centuries just like all the great works uh from the classical romantic baroque period 20th century are now part of repertoire that many pianists play uh, we want to create repertoire that pianists in the future will play and also i feel like this work that we're doing is what keeps classical music alive and exciting at least for me i always love to go to concerts uh, or right now i can't go to concerts but i just listen to discover new works i, I love to go and check out works by composers that, that are just written and and just to constantly learn new things and learn new pieces i think it's it's what keeps it interesting to keeps it alive that's what it was like uh, in beethoven's time when beethoven <clears throat> wrote a piece 
people went to the premiere and that was exciting. That was the first time they heard it, where they very often asked for encores and the piece was played more than once in just one concert. And uh, that's the kind of excitement I want around classical music now. And I feel like what I do is, is helping, hopefully, uh, bring that excitement to audiences, make them interested in discovering new music, not just listening to music that they know very well, which is great music, but we always want to have something new in order to have the art form evolve and 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 uh, live and, and and be exciting. So I'm glad that the Grammys are very appreciative of that, actually, because there were quite a lot of uh, albums that that won Grammys that that featured new music. For example, the Los Angeles Philharmonic won the Grammy for Best uh, Orchestral Performance, and that was a work by also Andrew Norman, who wrote Frank's House for my CD, and he wrote that work for the Los Angeles Philharmonic, and uh, it had to do with um, climate change, and um, it, it it was a a great work called Sustain. So I was very excited, actually, because Los Angeles Philharmonic is kind of on the very cutting edge of new music they they commission a lot of composers they probably commission more new 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 music than any other orchestra at least they're among the top orchestras that really value new music and commission composers diverse composers you know women composers composers of color not just um kind of the presenting concerts of of music that older orchestras present but they're really trying hard to to bring to life uh, these new works and to give opportunities to diverse communities. And I, I really, really cherish them for that. And I'm so excited that we live here in Los Angeles where we can actually go to these premieres, at least um, we used to, and hopefully we will very soon once live concerts uh, are back. <laughs> Los Angeles is a huge city for music. And yes, um, the LA Philharmonic Orchestra are like definitely recognized for bringing um, new music, chamber music, so for the next question, um, the category that the Poetry of Places was nominated for was the best classical compendium. I was wondering for clarification of the terminology of best classical compendium, how does that differentiate from other classical categories within the Grammy? Well, classical compendium is a category where um, the CD has to either have a theme um, that, that unites all the pieces, but having the theme alone is not enough. So it also needs to feature works um, that are different in genre. So I, for example, have solo works and I have ensemble works with different combinations of instruments. So other works in compendium could be like concertos, instrumental concertos, and then vocal works or uh, orchestral works and then works for orchestra and solos and then also solo works. So it's kind of a combination of genres and usually there is a theme, not always, uh, but but having a theme is definitely nice, having some kind of a unifying element to the CD. Other classical categories included best classical solo albums, so that would be only solo works mm -hmm. uh, or mainly solo works, or uh, best classical vocal ar uh, album where there are vocal wor works, uh, chamber vocal or works, and then there's also best opera recording, for example, for best opera recording. So uh, it has to do with uh, the instrumentation, a lot of it. And then... Um, sometimes thematic um, content. So there's also a Best Chamber Music Gram Grammy for Best Chamber Music Album, where it's all chamber music. And actually for my first album, I was nominated both for Classical Compendium and in the Best Chamber Music category for that piece by Tom Flaherty that I talked about for Toy Piano, Piano and Electronics. And normally in that category, a whole CD gets nominated, the whole chamber music CD. But for that, I guess that piece resonated with so many people. They nominated just that track in that whole category where all the other recordings were complete CDs of chamber music. So, <laughs> so, so those are the different classical, um, classical categories in the Grammys. Best classical compendium must be like a huge honor to be awarded this. Yes. Um, <laughs> awarded in this category. Um, why do you think that the Poetry Places was awarded best, best classical compendium, if you would like to tell us? <laughs> I don't know. I guess a lot of people listened to it and liked it and voted for it. It, it was... Um, I, I performed the pieces quite a lot. It was also featured on um, many radio stations, um, dozens and dozens of radio stations. And um, it was an album people were interested in checking out and listening to. So I think that definitely helped. Um, and and the, the composers are definitely the kind of composers that people look forward to uh, listening to new pieces by. So I had um, actually... A, 
a Pulitzer winner and two Pulitzer finalists on the CD. So you can see like the caliber of composers that were presented. Uh, they're definitely major composers that that people really like to um, check out and 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 um, listen to their music. So I think the combination of having these great composers, these very interesting works um, that were thematically interesting and uh, having me perform them uh, in many places and if people were interested in my artistry i think all of that together resonate must have resonated with people but of course i never know why <laughs> cd wins a grammy you know just um it just means that enough people voted for it and chose it to be their favorite cd i guess so i'm extremely extremely grateful and fortunate interesting poetry places was not your first work to be nominated um your first cd release on women at the piano um, American Music of 2013 was nominated for the 58th Annual Grammy Awards back in 2015. Um, have you seen any growth between these two albums? Growth? I mean, they're, they're different. Um, they're different. The, the theme for the Azai CD was kind of funny. It was the... <laughs> Um, the end of the world that didn't happen, <laughs> according to the Mayan <laughs> calendar. I was just thinking, I, I wanted to commission works that were all written in 2013, which according to the Mayan calendar was going to be the last year. Um, so um, the beginning of Baktun, sort of a new era, a new Baktun. Um, and so that was kind of a funny, humorous uh, topic uh, and theme. The pieces were very different. Um, I, I feel like all the CDs, all three of my solo CDs feature works that are outstanding uh, by these composers, uh, but they're all very different. Um, my second CD, for example, was inspired by works that were inspired by other composers. So it was also a different theme and different take on it. Uh, composers were different, although some of the composers were featured on more than one of my CDs. One composer was featured on all three, actually, James Matheson, who used to work with the Los Angeles Philharmonic. He was the composer fellowship director there. And he's a New York based composer. But other than that, um, most composers are different. So of course the styles are very different. The pieces are very different. Um, I liked it. I, I liked it that I was able to record the last CD at Skywalker Sound. That was definitely quite an experience. Although my first CD I recorded at Pomona College at Little Bridges, which also has wonderful acoustic there, Bridges Auditorium. So, but they were each uh, a very unique experience. And um, for me, I guess uh, since my first CD, I, I would say I've been definitely touring and commissioning more work. So I once once I did that first project. Uh, and commission works for it. I think I've been sort of on a roll, um, commissioning and performing more and more works um, every year. So, so in that sense, that really jump started sort of my um, career in performing works and my collaboration with composers definitely doubled and tripled uh, the amount of work that I bring to life, basically. So that was a great project because people, uh, more people found out about me because the CD was Grammy nominated. So people, um, that was my first major release. My first solo release was a major label. And um, that definitely gave me a connection with a lot of composers who I didn't work with before, who wanted to write for me and whose work uh, works I presented. So that definitely opened up in terms of uh, my, uh, my level of activity as a performer of new music. That definitely helped me become even more active than I was before and like really dedicate all my all my time that I have outside of teaching to it. So that, that was great. But in terms of the work and the quality of the CD, I think that the quality of each of my three solo CDs is, is, is top notch. And I worked for many, many years on each CD and made sure that uh, I knew the pieces really well, performed them a lot before the recording, the recording process itself uh, was great. I, I had wonderful producers who uh, were perfectionists like me. And so I, I'm very happy with how each of these albums turned out. And then also the other albums, new music albums that are recorded for uh, other composers who were not all my my albums, but for, for whom I recorded tracks. So I, I feel like there's definitely growth in that I perform a lot more new works and I, and I premiere a lot more new works uh, each year as, as the time goes by. And I think the first CD really helped me get there, kind of put my name on the map, um, connect me to other composers. Because I also, through the Grammy process, I also discovered a lot of com new composers and I discovered a lot of new, perf new music performers. And um, through the Grammy process, even meeting them at the Grammys, listening to their albums. Um, so, so definitely the knowledge I have of the music industry now and um, of what, you know, what people do now, kind of what's, 
um, what's the most cutting edge, um, what are the most cutting edge um, things that people are doing, whether it's in, in composing or in performance. Um, so, so that definitely kind of started all of that. And having the sabbatical to do it definitely helped me having the sabbatical from Calpoli and the support um, from Calpoli and then from external grants that actually made that project happen. I, I would say that that also made it easier for my third CD in terms of getting funding and uh, just, you know, doing everything just uh, at the highest level, you know, being at the best recording studio, having the best people working, uh, the most qualified and experienced people working on the project. And uh, definitely the first CD helped with all of that. It takes a lot of help. It seems to like take a lot of help. It takes a village. <laughs> Oh yes, it, uh, yeah, it's a huge collaborative project. Not just the performers I collaborated with and the composers, but also, uh, you know, the recording engineer. The recording engineer on all three albums was actually my husband Barry Werger, and he's a wonderful recording engineer. And it was great to have this family project to work on these works together. And he actually got a Grammy for the Poetry of Places as an engineer as well. So we each got a Grammy for wow. this album, which is very, very nice to have that as a family project and to have it be recognized. Um, for both me and, and for my husband. Nice. For any artist who wants their work to be honored and recognized, um, what are the steps to become a Grammy-nominated artist? Is there like a committee that like notices your work or do you put yourself like out there to like get noticed by a committee? Well, um, I think the most important thing is to to really promote the CD, to make sure that when the CD comes out, people know about it, people listen to it. So I had a great publicist too. And so the CD got a lot of radio play and was reviewed in a lot of publications. So people read about it and they got interested and they, they listened to it. So that's really important to, to really promote the CD when it comes out so that uh, it kind of puts you on the map and, and people more people know about it so that some of those people who are Grammy voters would then consider it. Um, it's not known who Grammy voters are. They keep it secret. Uh, so the way the process works is when the, C when the CD comes out and when it's time um, to submit CDs for Grammy consideration, usually the label submits the CD for Grammy consideration, but people who are independent artists who have independent labels or self-release, they could also submit as long as they're Grammy members and you have to qualify for Grammy membership, which is not easy. Uh, there is, there's a quite high level criteria in order to become a Grammy member, Grammy voting member. Uh, but anybody who is a Grammy voting member can submit a CD and normally it's the recording labels that submits it. And then once it's in the consideration, there are thousands of CDs that are submitted for the process. And then uh, after that, um, members of the Recording Heart Academy vote and um, that's confidential information. Nobody knows like, who those members are. And then um, the top 15 albums, I think, uh, 15 or 20, I don't really know the rules for sure, but um, top 15 or 20 albums then make it to a committee and nobody knows who is on that committee either that all, they also keep that secret. <laughs> and then so people of the committee listen to the CDs and then they choose, I guess they vote and choose the top five. And those are the ones that get the nomination. So that's what I heard um, happens in the process. And then once uh, five CDs are nominated, then um, these are the official nominated CDs and then people um, vote on, on those and then whoever gets the most vote in the final round, I think the, um, it's whoever gets the most votes uh, wins. There's no committee for that. It's just um, people, uh, people listen to the five CDs that are nominated and choose one. Interesting. Was Poetry Places submitted just for Best Classical Compendium? Um, it was actually nominated... Um, in two categories, um, it, it was also nominated for producer of the year for the producers of the CD, Victor and Marilyn Ledeen. Um, and um, for producer of the year, uh, it's basically all the CDs that these producers produce. So they produced quite a lot of CDs that year. So um, they were nominated uh, as producers of the year. They actually got a nomination as producers of the year. And the CD was one of the CDs that um, contributed to that. So it had two official nominations. And, uh, and the producers actually won as producers when the CD won in Classical Compendium, because in that category, the way it works is the artist gets the award and then the producers get the award and also the engineer gets the award. So that's why 
I got an award for engineering for my husband, Barry Warger, and for producers, Marina and Victor Ledin. They also got, it was their first Grammy, and they were nominated, I think, more than 10 times. Uh, and they've been in the industry for over 30 years, and this was their first um, Grammy award uh, with the CD. So I was so, so happy for them because I've been in this industry for so long. They've produced so many really wonderful recordings. And it was great to see them finally recognized with, with an actual Grammy. But they had very many nominations before. They're very, very experienced uh, producers. So, and they were also producers of my first album as well. And my second album had an amazing producer, uh, Elaine Martone, who actually is nominated this year as producer of the year. She worked with the Los Angeles Master Chorale and uh, Nike Sinclair, our as the newest full-time faculty member, um, sings with the Los Angeles Master Chorale. And they, um, they recorded a work, new work by Eric Whitaker, I think. And uh, it was a wonderful album. So the producer uh, got nominated as producer of the year for all these different albums that she produced, including the one by Los Angeles Master Chorale. So I'm, I'm very excited because she she's the one who produced my second CD. So all my producers are sort of top <laughs> uh, on top of their field. Yes. As of the time of this recording, the Grammy nominations were announced. Um, some interesting stuff within like popular music section, but we also have like all these other sections too, film music, jazz, and classical music. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, but wow, thank you for like talking about like all this like Grammy stuff and the album process as well. How does the future look for you? Um, any like upcoming projects? Um, anything that we should keep an eye out for? Uh, yes, I, I'm working on my next major project. That's going to be my fourth solo CD. It's going to be a while. Uh, the, the works are not even written yet, but they're being written right now. And this project is going to be about soccer. So it's going to be uh, music and soccer, uh, sort of uh, finding the connection there and the inspiration in soccer. Um, and that project will I will hopefully record next summer in 2021. Um, uh, if everything goes well, if I can, if the pieces are ready, and then it'll probably be, it'll be a few years before it gets completed and released, but that's my next major project. But I also recorded, uh, pieces for two, uh, major CDs that are coming out uh, early next year. One of them is by composer Vera Ivanova, and that CD is going to come out on Naxos, which is one of the biggest labels, especially for new music. And um, I recorded a 20 minute piece that that I actually arranged a consortium commission for. So I was among 25 pianists who performed and premiered this piece. I was the consortium leader and I'm the one who made the world premiere recording of the piece. I'm very excited about that CD. That's going to be very interesting. And Vera Ivanova is a um, professor at Chapman University and she's a great colleague. She also uh, composed a piece um, for me that I recorded on my second CD quotation is on homages. Um, so this is my second recording for her. And then I also recorded a piece, a piano sonata for composer Jose Cerebrier. And he is a very well-known conductor and composer. He's, um, I think in his 80s, he's one of the top conductors in the world. And uh, this is going to be a mainly orchestral CD. Um, and it will have um, the solo work, might be the only solo work on the CD, is, is my performance of his early sonata, which he wrote when he was 17 and a student at the Curtis Institute of Music. It was written in the 1950s. Um, so it's one of his earliest works, actually. Uh, and this composer, actually, his CD is right now nominated for his current CD, um, is nominated for Best Classical Compendium this year. So he's also a very, uh, very... Um, well-known and, and uh, distinguished composer and conductor. So this, this, this CD that's nominated now is uh, featuring his works and uh, one new work of his for concerto for piano and orchestra. So it's a wonderful piece that I really like. Um, so, and this will be an upcoming CD of his that will be coming out next year. So those are two CDs that I already recorded for during my sabbatical um, in the spring. And so this is something that's already in the works that's coming out soon, early next year. And then my uh, major solo CD will be coming out probably a year or so after that. Yes. Please keep a look out for Dr. Spichenko. Um, where can like the audience like um, listen to your works or if they want to like reach you out on social media? Um, well, if they go to my website, there are links to, to social media and um, um, they could go to my YouTube channel and they could hear 
my uh, my recordings, uh, mainly my videos. So they could also go to Spotify and listen to the audio of all these albums. They're all on Spotify or, or Apple Music or um, in, may, like any other platform. Basically, it's all there. Um, social media, you know, that I'm on. I have an artist page on Facebook. Um, I'm also on Twitter and on Instagram. So they could just look for my name, Nadia Spachenko. If they type it and spell it correctly, it will come up. <laughs> So, um, yeah, they, they should definitely find me and, and follow me. I would be very excited to, to see new, new followers, new people to connect with. Do you have um, any last words that you would like to say to the audience? Any parting words, advice? I just look forward to the time when I can see you all in person <laughs> and uh, learn about what you're doing. And uh, if you're a student at Cal Poly, I'm excited to, to hear you play, to hear you compose to hear your pieces if you're a composer if you're a songwriter uh to just get to know you uh in person this is such a strange year and difficult year um and I, i'm glad i'm able to connect with my students online but i'm really looking forward to actually seeing them in person getting to know them in person and um teaching on campus um someday going back to to normal but in the meantime i think it's great to just keep creating, keep working hard and uh, keep positive and uh, know that this difficult time will pass and uh, to just keep creating and holding on. Uh, and once that time comes, when we can go back to normal, just really delve into performing and connecting with, with each other, connecting with audiences. I'm looking forward to that time and I'm looking forward to hearing the work of my colleagues and my students and the community and hear what everybody is doing and hope that they all stay healthy and safe and um and, and continue creative if they're um if they're musicians or any kind of creators and and just just keep the inspiration going all of us are longing to get back into like nor they call it like normalcy like yes you know when live music comes back when people can like collaborate in person again all that stuff but still, we still need to like maneuver through all of what's happening right now. And yes, I hope that we can like make, you know, the best out of this situation. We have reached the end of our podcast. Um, Dr. Strachenko, I would like to thank you for um, dropping by and speaking to us this podcast. It's like a very lovely discussion about like, you know, um, time at Cal Poly, Poetry Places, and being in a Grammy award-winning artist. Well, thank you. I was very happy to, to share my experience and um, to talk to you and to talk to the Cal Poly music community. So yeah, I hope everyone will have a nice day. Thank you for tuning in. Bye.